the first woman to uncover the homo thugs. She talking about Diddy. That's what these down low b was called when Wendy first started talking about it in the 90s, the homo thug. So you hear about stories of Diddy like shooting people, yeah. blowing up cars. Yeah. Is he this gangster that behind the scenes that ever, is that him? Or is that Shout right? out to Wendy Williams. Gene Deal and Jaguar Wright have been one of Diddy's biggest detractors over the last few years. And shocking new information is now coming to light about how Diddy unalived a young child at a stampede. Tell me about the city college stampede that took place where nine people died. Cause I know you blame Diddy for that situation. Well, we were we were we were scheduled to do the outside of the college, outside of the gym. Amazing. Cause that's what my team was good at. You understand? I had 18 guys prepared to be outside to make sure that we could get the crowd in order. You understand? Before there was any crowd, you gotta set the things up before you even get the crowd like that, especially in those type of things. And back then in the days, we used to have dogs and everything. I would have a guy with two dogs walking the street, making sure people get go down the lane, you know what I'm saying, and don't bum rush the doors. You know, people ain't bum rushing the doors when you got dogs out there. You know what I mean? So, and it's crazy that we have to do parties like that, but that was one of our security things that we did. So now, um, Puff called me and said, yo, Gene, we only need eight guys. I said, eight guys, you can't, ain't no way you're gonna do the suit of college with eight guys. He said, no, Heavy D, cause him and Heavy D was doing a party together. He was like, yo, Heavy D want the FOIs to do the outside. I said, the FOIs? He said, yeah. So I, I said, yo, fuck it, I ain't gonna do it. You know, and then my man, who's my partner, Slick, said, yo, man, we're gonna go ahead and do it, man. And we just gonna get a couple of bottles, just gonna chill, and you know, we just we just go outside. We we do the outside, we we do the downstairs. So Puff told me that, you know, he just wanted us to do inside the gym to make sure that nobody, you know, be over the celebrities like that. that anyway, so he cut the security and he got the FOIs and the FOIs left their post and that's how the people bum rushed the door and nine people died by going down those corridors. And you blame Diddy for that? Yeah, I do. It's his fault. But it's Jessica's fault for shutting the door. Cause had she not shut the door, people would have just walked in the gym and you'd have a gym full of people. Do you understand what I'm saying? Nobody would have probably died. It's her fault and it's his fault. So you really think it's Diddy's fault? Why you believe that? Because you don't cut security to save a dollar. You don't cut security when Security is the most important thing that you gotta have at these places. And that's what he did. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't listen. He didn't listen, he didn't listen. And I even told him, I said, yo, if the FOIs don't get a barricade away from this door, people gonna die tonight. I told that to him. And what happened? Nine people died that night. What was his reaction to the nine people died? I didn't talk to him for a while. He used to come around with us with the same game, and he just say, yo, he just speak to Gene. He like, yo, what up, Gene? I'll be like, yo, what up? I didn't speak to him until after that Suge Knight stuff that they had with Jake in Atlanta. That's when I started back really speaking to him. Wow, because you felt the type of way about what he did? Nah, come on, bro. Nine kids died, bro. I was pumping the chest of one little boy when my man was crying. Even hearing Gene talk about it is heartbreaking. Talking about, yo, this is my first time him being out. This is the first time him being out, bruh. My mama gonna kill me. I'm pumping on the chest of a little 17 year old boy. How would you feel? What Gene is talking about, of course, is the 1991 City College Stampede. A dangerous stampede broke out in a Harlem basement gymnasium when an oversized crowd tried to get a glimpse of celebrities at a basketball charity event organized by Puff Daddy, better known today as Diddy or Sean Combs. By the end of December 28, 1991, 
nine people had died, and at least 29 others had been injured when an anxious crowd attempted to force their way into a city college gym to see a game featuring Boys 2 Men, Run DMC, Jodeci, Heavy D, and Big Daddy Kane. Charmaine Jones, a witness and victim, says she is still deeply affected by what happened that night and can count on one hand the number of large-scale events she has attended since. I still find myself traumatized, she tells the Daily Beast. If I go to a concert, if I'm not in the first five rows, I'm not going. I don't do large crowds. I don't do larger rooms. Even to this day, I still have lower back pain from that, she adds. I didn't want to go to the hospital because I was just like, I'm okay. Some people lost their lives. At the end of the day, I'm alive and I have my life. But that's definitely something that I had nightmares for weeks because the screaming, people were looking for their friends. It was a horror show. Jones had come to the City College campus in Harlem to watch the game in the gym, which had a capacity of 2,700. According to the New York Times, at least 5,000 people showed out to try to get one of the 1,200 tickets available at the door for $1.20. There were two queues set up, one for people who had purchased tickets in advance and another for those who bought them at the door. The two lines snaked their way into the building, passing through the lobby and down a flight of steps to the gym in the basement, which was protected from the landing by four metal doors. However, just one door was left open for organizers to collect tickets and frisk attendees. The long process irritated the audience, and small skirmishes broke out as the game's 6 p.m. tip-off time approached. When the bleachers were nearly full and the game hadn't begun by 7 p.m., tensions boiled over. When organizers decided to close the building's entrance doors, chaos ensued as those outside rushed in causing a disastrous ripple effect as a sea of people shoved their way inside, pushing those in front of them through glass windows, toppling people down the stairwell, and causing those at the bottom of the stairs to collapse or surge toward the gym doors. Jones claims she was forced through a glass window pane while people piled on top of her, leaving her unable to breathe. How we survived is, myself and my two friends, we got into a bathroom stall, Jones said. There were literally people that were laying on the ground and the three of us got into a bathroom stall and we hid in the bathroom until everything died down. Jones says she put a tangerine in the pocket of her leather jacket before leaving for the event, intending to eat it beforehand but never got around to it. When we finally got out of there, I reached into my pocket and there was nothing left but the skin of the tangerine, she recalled. It stained my lovely jacket and I kept that jacket for years as a reminder. Meanwhile, at the foot of the stairs, the ticket collector at the gym door witnessed the commotion breaking out as individuals attempted to battle their way inside. They stood up, went into the gym, and closed the door, which could only be opened externally. The mob at the bottom of the stairs had nowhere to go and were forced against the doors by the oblivious people at the top of the stairs, who continued to push forward. Injured persons were scattered about at the bottom of the stairway, trampled on, fainting, or both. According to the Washington Post, it took 15 excruciating minutes for anyone to comprehend what was happening. The game was still in full swing. When the doors of the gym finally opened, those inside reported that people were forced up against the walls, packed in like sardines. An announcement over the intercom stated that three people had died and that the game had been canceled, prompting many to evacuate the arena, resulting in another panic as people rushed to exit the gym. People started running, attendee Daryl Frederick told the Times. People were pushing down other people. People on the bottom were getting trampled. People jumped off the bleachers and crushed them. Lynette Delane, then 18, also attended the fatal event, telling the Times in 1991, a girl was sitting up on my chest. She wasn't even conscious. I just thank God I'm still alive. No one even cared. They wouldn't stop pushing. Delane still considers herself fortunate to have escaped that building, telling the Daily Beast that she has been able to continue her journey. I just think I'm a very resilient person, she continued, and I was grateful to have survived that situation. Both Delane and Jones expressed disappointment and surprise that something so deadly and preventable could still happen 30 years after the stampede in which they were caught. 
They should have protocols in place so something like this doesn't happen again, Jones says, adding that attending a concert shouldn't put you at risk of getting trampled due to a lack of crowd management. Combs has addressed his culpability in the Harlem Stampede, saying in 1998, City College is something I deal with every day of my life. But the things that I deal with can in no way measure up to the pain that the families deal with. I just pray for the families and pray for the children who lost their lives every day. Many, however, who spoke out against Combs found themselves being silenced in a very suspicious fashion. This is something Jaguar Wright has spoken about before. I was thinking to myself the other day, Uptown Records started with five people. Andre Harrell, I'll be sure, Heavy D and Puffy. And Kim was the longest working employee because she was there from the very beginning. She was Andre's personal assistant. Kim is dead. Heavy D is dead. Andre Harrell is dead. The only two left are Puffy and Al, and Al almost isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Heavy D was found dead, face down in the heart attack. Andre Harrell, heart attack. Kim died from pneumonia, but there's the first coroner's report that said that she died. It, it was ruled a homicide and they found toxins in her body to prove that she had been poisoned. You know, they, they have poisons that create heart attack and pneumonia-like symptoms. Then right after that, Al had a meeting and I was gonna meet up with him because we were in Vegas and then the next thing you know. You wanna know what they all had in common though? The survivors and the, and, and the late of Uptown Records, they were all writing tell-all books. Andre was writing a book right before he died. Heavy D was working on a book before he died. Kim Porter was working on a book before she died. And Al B. Sure was working on the documentary of his life. And then he goes into a coma. Has Puffy ever been in a coma? Has he, has anything happened to him? He must be the luckiest motherfucker because it seems like everybody that worked at Uptown Records from the very beginning. Come on, just him. I guess Al disappointed you. You know, it's, I speak for a reason. When you see this bullshit ass motherfucking game fucking with people that you love, that you like, you know, that you... There's too many coincidences. Hey, Cole. Oh. <laughs> Stamp it. We gonna get you and your little dog, too. Mm. And congratulations, young man. <laughs> Run as fast as Cassie did. <laughs> and the stampede isn't the only public tragedy Diddy has been involved in. Almost 25 years ago, just after 2.30 a.m. on a frigid winter night, three NYPD detectives were dispatched to the Midtown North Precinct. Sean Combs, also known as Puffy, his girlfriend Jennifer Lopez, his bodyguard Anthony Wolf Jones, and rapper Jamal Shine Barrow were all arrested following a shooting in a Times Square club that injured three witnesses. The cops discovered Lopez, then 30, cuffed in the cage. Combs was also in the station house on West 54th Street. His plans for a grand celebration of the new millennium a few days later suddenly halted. According to two law enforcement sources, the historic shooting and trial may be reinvestigated as part of a broader federal investigation against Combs, 54, also known as Diddy, who has a history of strange shootings. Homeland Security investigators raided Combs' houses in Los Angeles and Miami, according to law enforcement sources, in response to claims of sex trafficking. They got eyes on him in Miami, and the feds are talking to witness after witness, New York criminal defense lawyer Michael Dishiowaro, who is acquainted with the case, told The Post. 
They're corroborating everything they can, but everything past and present is on the table with Mr. Diddy right now. The federal investigators invaded Diddy's properties one month after Rodney Lil Rod Jones filed an explosive complaint alleging that the music mogul sexually attacked him repeatedly between September 2022 and November 2023, while Jones worked as a producer and cinematographer for The Billionaire. Jones compared Combs to Jeffrey Epstein, accusing the tycoon of grabbing his genitals, grooming him for sex, and pushing him to hire sex workers, strippers, and drug dealers. His suit came less than three months after Diddy settled an explosive sexual violence lawsuit filed by his former girlfriend, R&B singer Cassie. Cassie claimed that Diddy ran an Epstein-like operation involving sexual assault, human trafficking, and blackmail with hidden cameras that captured high-profile figures in entertainment, politics, and sports in homosexual acts and other compromising situations. Jones said in his lawsuit that Diddy was abusive, threatened to eat his face, flashed guns, and, most importantly, was frequently bragging about bribing witnesses and jurors in the criminal case concerning the 1999 NYC nightclub shooting with Shine. The shooting resulted from an argument between Diddy and Matthew Allen, a Brooklyn thug known as Scar. But Diddy, his bodyguard Anthony Jones, and Shine Barrow went through a seven-week trial in February and March 2001, which culminated with Diddy and Jones walking free and Barrow, then 21, being convicted of assault and weapons possession and sentenced to 10 years in jail. The Club New York shooting remains a mystery, particularly for former NYPD detective Derek Parker, who left the NYPD's so-called hip-hop cop squad and now works as a private investigator. For years, Diddy has been dogged by claims that he forced Shine, now known as Moses Michael Levy Barrow, the opposition leader of Belize's House of Representatives, to accept responsibility for the incident. The story was that Puff was flossing, which is what they call someone on the streets who's throwing money around and acting like a big shot, Parker explained. Scar felt disrespected because he felt he was as important as Puff and words were exchanged, and then bullets started flying. There were shots fired, and Lopez and Diddy exited the club in a Lincoln Navigator. Wardle Fenderson, Diddy's driver, later admitted he went through multiple red lights as they careened down 43rd Street and onto 8th Avenue, weaving past two police cruisers. Shine busted off! Shine busted off in the air! Fenderson quoted Lopez as saying, before cops pulled them over. Parker told the Post that in the precinct, her mother was yelling at J-Lo in Spanish and she was really mad at Jennifer. I heard her say, I told you not to get involved with him. Lopez was released without charge after 14 hours in detention. Her publicist declined to comment to the Post, but sources in her camp confirmed that she was not charged in 1999. Natanya Rubin, one of three victims in the club shooting, has long claimed that Combs shot her in the face. Jones claimed in his lawsuit that Diddy openly boasted about carrying out the shooting and bribing witnesses and jurors to ensure his acquittal. Mr. Combs shared that he was responsible for the shooting in the nightclub in New York, Jones claimed. He also claims Diddy bragged about employing Lopez to smuggle the gun inside the club. He shared that artist and Mr. Combs' girlfriend at the time, Jennifer Lopez, a.k.a., J-Lo carried the gun into the club for him and passed him the gun after he got into an altercation with another individual, Jones claims. Diddy, through his attorneys, has rejected Jones's allegations. His lawyer referred to the government raids as a witch hunt and blasted the military-level force utilized. Diddy had the support of Glenn Beck, who was manning security at the club that night and is now a martial arts expert for Deadly Art of Survival magazine. Beck testified at the 2001 trial, but told the Post that it appeared the prosecution was determined to nail Diddy and thus did not question him about Barrow, a.k.a. Shine. He termed Jones' assertions bullshit and stated, We knew Scar. We knew Shine. He was a wild kid from Brooklyn. Beck claimed that just as Diddy and Scar were fighting, Shine fled out of the club and returned a few minutes later without being inspected by security. That's when the shooting began, he said. 
Then right after we heard shots ring out, Shine ran out the side door of the club that was attached to a hotel. He came flying out the doors and was immediately arrested by two cops who were outside and had heard the shots inside. Barrow admitted at trial that he pulled out a gun and fired during the altercation and has since confirmed that he took the blame for Diddy. During a recent interview with Channel 5 Belize, Barrow was asked if Diddy's legal problems are hurting his reputation now that he is facing multiple allegations of sexual misconduct, assault, and other offenses. It opens wounds when you hear, you know, the victim saying that, you know, it was Diddy that shot her, Shine told the news organization. And that was triggered by a lawsuit from a producer, Lil Rod, that produced on the Love album, who is making accusations. And in those accusations, he says that the gentleman confessed to the shooting. The producer Shine was referring to is Rodney Lil Rod Jones, who also accused Diddy of sexual assault and harassment before Diddy's mansions in New York and Miami were raided for alleged sex trafficking. Shine, the current head of the Belize United Democratic Party, went on to add that he remained constant throughout the process and maintained his innocence more than two decades later. Everyone knew all along that I was the fall guy, Barrow said, but my political enemies and, you know, detractors try to make me into, you know, this criminal. But everyone knew that I was a young kid that took the fall. Everyone knew that. That was the story. I'm just saying that I maintain my innocence all this time. I didn't get into who did what, but the victim is telling you who did what. And I understand that there are other witnesses. Fragments were never removed, so there was never any forensic testing to say who it was. But the victims are vindicating me. Witnesses are vindicating me, but I have moved on. I am not trying to relive that, he continued. And so I am appreciative of whatever contributions that Diddy has made to help the people of Belize. I wish him well, and I pray for him, and I pray for the alleged victims. And if it is true, may justice be served. And if it's not, it's a tragedy because a global icon would have been destroyed. Meanwhile, Sean Diddy Combs requested a federal judge on Friday to dismiss a lawsuit accusing him and two co-defendants of raping a 17-year-old girl in a New York recording studio in 2003, calling it a false and hideous claim filed too late under the law. The legal action is the latest counterattack from the 54-year-old hip-hop entrepreneur and his legal team following many similar cases and a related criminal sex trafficking investigation. Mr. Combs and his companies categorically deny plaintiff's decades-old tale against them, which has caused incalculable damage to their reputations and business standing before any evidence has been presented, the complaint said, naming Combs-owned corporations as defendants. Plaintiff cannot allege what day or time of year the alleged incident occurred, but miraculously remembers other salacious details despite her alleged incapacitated condition. The case was launched in December and amended in March by a lady who now lives in Canada, but whose name was not revealed in the court filing. She claimed she was in 11th grade at a high school in a Detroit suburb in 2003 when Harve Pierre, then president of Combs' Bad Boy Entertainment record label, flew her to New York on a private jet and took her to a recording studio where she was given drugs and alcohol until she was unable to consent to sexual activity. Then, according to the lawsuit, Pierre, Combs, and an unknown male raped her one after the other. The lawsuit contained images of the woman sitting on Combs' lap, which she claimed were taken on the night in question. The defense filing requests that the action be dismissed now with prejudice, which means it cannot be refiled, to protect the Combs defendants from further reputational injury and before more party and judicial resources are squandered. Michael J. Williman, one of the plaintiff's attorneys, stated in a statement in reaction to the filing, At this point, no one should take anything Diddy or his lawyers say seriously. Today's motion is just a desperate attempt by Combs to avoid accountability for Miss Doe's allegations of gang rape and sexual assault. It won't work. At this early stage of the action, the arguments are procedural rather than factual. Some of the lawsuits filed against Combs involve decades-old allegations, and they are among the more than 3,700 legal claims filed under New York's Adult Survivors Act, 
which temporarily suspends certain legal deadlines to give sexual assault victims one last chance to sue for abuse that occurred years or even decades ago. The new deadlines imposed by that statute have expired, but the suit against which Combs filed the petition on Friday was filed under a separate law, New York City's Victims of Gender-Motivated Violence Protection Statute. That local legislation also allows accusers to file civil lawsuits alleging sexual assault after the statute of limitations has expired. However, Combs' motion claims that the action was filed too late since the city law is preempted by state law, which requires the lawsuit to be submitted by August 2021 to be timely. New York state law trumps New York City law without exception, the lawsuit states. The updated version of the complaint filed in March attempted to resolve some of these flaws, but Combs' lawyers claim it did not go far enough. The judge has ordered that if the action proceeds following this challenge, the woman must provide her name. The Associated Press does not normally name anyone who claims to have been sexually abused unless they come forward publicly, as several of Combs' accusers have. Friday's defense filing also faults the suit for containing a bolded, legally irrelevant trigger warning calculated to focus attention on its salacious and depraved allegations. Last month, Combs also moved to dismiss a lawsuit filed by Joy Dickerson, who said she was a 19-year-old college student when Combs drugged and sexually abused her. That's all for the video, folks. Thanks for watching.